situation. It's a blessing to have you all for worship this morning as we come together to celebrate uh, the proclamation of the gospel and the administration of a sacrament here with holy baptism for Arden. And we're excited uh, also to celebrate uh, the kids and the staff and the faculty and the administration who are getting ready for a new school year. So we'll be praying over them as well today. We've got a lot going on. If this is your first time at St. Luke's, I'd like to invite you to look at the inside of your pew. You're going to see a bunch of cards there at the inside of your pew. And the first one's the Connect card. If this is your first time at St. Luke's, we'd love it if you filled that out and left it in the offering baskets that are by the doors on the way out this morning. And then you'll start to get the weekly emails and you'll find more ways or new ways to connect and make new friends and relationships at St. Luke's. And so we'd love to help you make that connection and start to, to plug in. Uh, the blue, green, and orange cards all have QR codes on them for information about St. Luke's uh, that comes right from the website. So you can use your camera app on your phone, and it'll pull that up on the website. So you can find out about all the different ministries and happenings that are going on um, at different times and in different seasons. And then finally is the gray prayer card. And if you would like to have... Uh, a concern or a thanksgiving, something that's uh, going on in your life or, or in the life of somebody you just bring in with you on your heart this morning, you can fill that out. And while we're shaking hands, and even during that first hymn, if you'd make your way back and take that card and stick it right there in that back uh, box uh, basket right down the center aisle, then the welcome team will bring that forward and we'll pray over those during service. So uh, things that are on your heart or celebrations that you'd like to give thanks for, all of those things uh, we'd pray over during our service. That's all the announcements that I have for you this morning before we begin our worship. So I'm going to invite you to please rise, to shake some hands, share the peace of the Lord with the people around you, maybe even introduce yourself to somebody new.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all of my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your boundless mercy, for the sake of your holy, bitter, bitter sufferings and death, beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this your confession, I by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> Son and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Glory be to God on high, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. We praise thee, we bless thee, we worship thee. We glorify thee, we give thanks to thee for thy great glory. O Lord God, heavenly King, God the Father Almighty, O Lord, the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, O Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, that takest away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us. Thou that takest away the sin of the world, receive our prayer. Thou that sittest at the right hand of God the Father, have mercy upon us. For thou only art holy, thou only art the Lord, thou only, O Christ, with the Holy Ghost, art most high in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you and with thy spirit. Let us pray. Almighty and most merciful God, preserve us from all harm and danger, that we, being ready in both body and soul, may cheerfully accomplish what you want done. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated as our reading today is from Acts chapter 13. And Becky, come on up. I think this is Becky's first time reading the scriptures for us, yeah? And it is a long one, so I'm sorry. It'll be right on the screen, or right here. Now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos, 
and came to Perga and Pamphylia. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But they went on from Perga and set from Antioch and Pisidia. And on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. After the reading from the law and the prophets, the ruler of the synagogue sent a message to them, saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. So Paul stood up and motioning with his hand, Men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and made them the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with uplifted arm, he led them out of it. And for about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an, an inheritance. All this took about 450 years. And after that, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king. And God gave them Saul, the son of Achish a man of the tribe of Benjamin. For 40 years, and when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, and whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. Of this man's offspring, God, a son of Jesse, God has brought Israel a savior, Jesus, as he promised. Before his coming, John had proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all people of Israel. And as God was finishing his course, he said, What do you suppose that I am? I am not he. No, but behold, after me one is coming, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. Brothers, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you who feel God, ha to us has been sent the message of this salvation. For those who live in Jerusalem and the rulers, because they did not recognize him or understand the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by commending him, and though they have found him in no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written of him, they took down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead, and for many days he appeared to those who had come up and who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witness to the people. And we bring you the good news that God has promised to the fathers. This he has fulfilled to us their children by raising Jesus. As also it is written in the second palm psalm, <laughs> You are my son, today I have begotten you. And as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption. He has spoken in this way. I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore, he has also, he says also in other palm, you have not let your holy one see corruption. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised did not see corruption. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him everyone who believes is freed from everything which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest is what said in the prophets could come about. Look, look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish. For I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe, even if one tells you to. As they went out, the people begged that these things might be told them in the next Sabbath. And they went to, after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout current converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas who, as they spoke with them, urged to continue in the grace of God. But the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, revealing him, revealing him, reviling. 
And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, it was, judge, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you, since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning you to Gentiles. For, the, for so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many were appointed to eternal life, believed, and the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole city, the whole region, but the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and leading men of the city, stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and drove them out of their district. But they shook off the dust from their feet and against them and went to Inconium. And the, discipline, and the disciples were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Word of the Lord. Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 10th chapter. Be to thee, o Lord. These twelve Jesus sent out instructing them, Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You received without paying, give without pay. Acquire no gold or silver or copper for your belts. No bag for your journey or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for the laborer deserves his food. And whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it and stay there until you depart. As you enter the house, greet it. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. Truly I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. You may be seated, and at this time we'll celebrate holy baptism for young Arden as Pastor Mike comes forward to baptize his grandchild. Absolutely. Anybody in the group here that'd like to come forward, please do. I know it's uh, hot odyssey time. Pastor Josh often has the kids who are in the audience or in the congregation come forward. If there's any kids out there who aren't in there, you're welcome to come up. We're going to stand up here. And looks like Hmm? I thought you were heading for that so you could be the candle lighter. I, w I can get it, absolutely. Perfect. Perfect. And you're welcome up in here. A couple of housekeeping notes here. Hi, this is my granddaughter, Adelia, and another granddaughter, Athena, and the new granddaughter, Arden. Right up here, right up here. And, uh, oh, here we are. Come on up, kids. Adelia, here you go. Come you on, be this. close. You're my kid. Yeah, there we go. The baptism Come dress right uh, that is being worn no today is uh, the dress that was made when one Victoria Kent, Victoria Cooper Kent, was baptized. That's my wife standing over there. Uh, in 1949, her grandma, Paula Dornfelt Cooper, made uh, this dress, and uh, all the sisters were baptized in it. Here's another sister, Georgia, and uh, all of our kids. David included, were baptized with this baptism dress, and now Arden. So quite a history, and we're proud of that history. It's a history of Christianity. It's a history of wearing white, because when you're washed in the blood of the Lamb, your sins are forgiven, and you are white as snow. It's a wonderful, uh, wonderful thing. And it's a wonderful thing to be here as Grandpa to Arden, and uh, as a pastor, emeritus, retired pastor. I've baptized all seven of my grandkids now, as soon as this one is completed. And uh, 
that's uh, there's no better feeling than that certainly we'll move on <laughs> water is what God uses to wash and to nourish the earth it's what we use to wash and nourish ourselves God uses water to cleanse us spiritually and to initiate us into his family people who are called Christians we celebrate now the washing of holy baptism for Arden Victoria Louise Benke Arden received the cross of Jesus Christ his cross is the sign of God's love for you take the cross of Jesus into the world and show forth its love in your life watch out okay. <laughs> our Lord commanded baptism saying go ye into all the world teach all nations we just heard the beautiful proclamation of the gospel from the book of Acts this morning, didn't we? It's all in there, all in that little chapter from the book of Acts. And he said, uh, teaching them the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. That's what we're here to do today, to baptize Arden into that historic Christian faith. And uh, I'm going to ask her a few questions, and she is obviously brilliant because she's my granddaughter. <laughs> but she's not able yet to answer these questions. And so we are all gathered as God's family to answer on her behalf. Oh, by the way, the godmother, Brooke, is my goddaughter. Okay? Didn't mention that. Her husband, Nick, their son, Anders, is around here somewhere, hiding back there. Okay. Yeah. And... Uh, yeah, so we were good friends with uh, Neil and Sandy Johnson, and Brooke was born <coughs> years ago, and uh, <laughs> we, we served as godparents for her. So it's uh, wonderful serendipity that uh, she's answering, and you can all answer with her, okay? I'm going to ask these questions of Arden. We'll all answer as God's people. Arden, do you believe in God the Father, the creator of heaven and earth? If so, then answer, I do believe. I do believe. Arden, you be oh, she's smiling just for that one. <laughs> do you believe in Jesus Christ, God's own Son, who came to this earth, who lived a perfect life, who suffered and died on the cross for our sins, who rose again from the dead, and who will come again on Judgment Day? If so, then answer, I do believe. I, I do, do believe. believe. Arden, do you believe in God, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter and Counselor, the one who works in our hearts and in our lives so that we can indeed come to faith? So then answer, I do believe. I do believe. Ardent, do you renounce the devil and all his works and all his ways? If so, then answer, I do renounce them. I do renounce them. And Arden, will you be baptized into this Christian faith? If so, then answer, I will. I will. Let's put her with her eyes looking up towards heaven, right over the font. And Arden... Victoria Louise Benke, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. There you go. And Grandpa made the water just the right temperature. <laughs> Arden received this uh, baptism napkin. It's white, even as your baptism gown is, and it symbolizes the righteousness of Christ, with which you are now clothed as a baptized member of God's family. And now we should light that baptism candle. Nick, can you do the honors? The baptism candle is now lit. It burns with the light of Christ, a light for the whole world, which now shines also in the life of Arden Victoria Louise Benke. We pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us this precious gift of a, of a little child to raise, to nurture, to teach, to love. And we pray that you would bless her life on this earth as your child, even as you bless the parents and other family members. Be with them. Keep them strong in the faith. And help Arden to grow up, to realize that life is a gift from you and that it is a gift which is so, so very precious. Help her to learn how to love so that she can be an ambassador of your love on this earth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And go now in peace with joy in your hearts to serve the Lord. Amen. And let's take a little stroll down the aisle for people to see. <laughs>
Thank you for coming up, kids. Appreciate it. <laughs> yes, the red hair comes from Grandpa. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I guess Casey might add red hair too, but I think it comes from me. We'll go ahead and continue with our hymn of the day. No, keep, keep it lit. Sure. Good work. Hey, what's the melody back there? another verse. There's a whole bunch of prayers for today, so I guess that means my sermon will get a little shorter. Just kidding. <laughs> Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing we have in Him. Amen. So, uh, we're looking through the, uh, the book of Acts, and we're going to start a uh, study last week, and now we're going to jump into this first missionary journey of Paul and Barnabas. They went on to Cyprus, now they're moving on to other extended areas of Gentile region. And we heard this proclamation of the gospel there in Antioch and Pisidia, and as uh, Paul is laying out in the synagogue on the study day before the Jews, the wonderful redemptive work of God. And we're going to take just a little bit of time to look over this and to examine it from a few different aspects to help us glean from it uh, what Luke, as the writer of, of Acts, would glean for the church as they continue to move on in the generations together. Now, um, and for my welcome team, I think I'm going to call the kids in. Okay, Dave, in a little while? Just as a heads up. Cool. So, because I'm going to adjust. I've got something I think we should talk about. So, anyway. First thing, if in your spiritual journey uh, and in your spiritual life, there's come a point where you've tried to share the gospel of Jesus or, or teach people the things that you believe, maybe somebody in your household, in your connections, family, friends, coworkers, or something like this, if that's one of the fruits that have begun to produce in your life, then you are also familiar with the reality that we see here. Failure is regular. And if you haven't yet, that's probably because you're scared of that truth. Failure is, is regular. Um, I was talking with Chelsea. She began uh, to serve here at St. Luke's. 
Um, and that, that concern of starting in a new position, a new ministry, is, is one of those things that just we all kind of experience, that desire to do well, to, to meet the needs and all those kind of things. And I told her, like I tell a lot of the guys that I talk with as the circuit visitor, um, I've, been, I've been a pastor for 12 years, something like this. And um, the one commonality that's been throughout this entire time is failure. And that's the truth. It's hard. You have all these ideas, all these expectations, all these things you want to accomplish, but the reality is that the mission of the gospel a lot of times looks and feels like failure. And we shouldn't be surprised by that. Because if we, all, if we go all the way back to Good Friday, what did that look like in the eyes of the people, the disciples, and all those standing around to watch? It looked like the very saving work of God had failed. But we take hope because there's a resurrection. And you might be interested to find out that Paul himself, the guy who wrote most of the New Testament, who's like the first big-time evangelist, if you don't count Stephen, who got things started in Samaria and around Jerusalem, but the guy who went to the Gentile world around the Mediterranean, this guy, if we do a little bit of the chronology and a little bit of the math, um, we notice that like, after his road to Emmaus time, the blind thing, and then seeing, and then he's hanging out in Damascus, and then he moves on back home to Tyre, and then he finishes in Antioch, before he does this missionary journey in Acts 13. <laughs> is about 15 years. So, what was Paul doing during all of that time? As, as Luke is recording the missionary work of, of Paul and Barnabas and all these churches that spring up or don't even throughout the Mediterranean world, what was he doing for 15 years? Was he going to the seminary? Probably not. Uh, he was, a, he was um, a Pharisee. He was very learned in the scriptures and all those kind of things. So certainly he was still studying and doing things like that. But he already had learned it throughout his youth. Chances are Paul, beginning with this proclamation from Jesus himself that he was going to be a light and he was going to be a, a, a missionary to the Gentiles, was sharing the good news of Jesus with people. But apparently during those 15 years, there was nothing to write about. A lot of failure. A lot of attempts, a lot of places where you thought, gosh, it's just not working out the way we would have liked it to work out. And that can be a comforting thing, because even as we see him go off in this missionary journey, there on Cyprus, there's not a lot to talk about here in Antioch. We see some believers cropping up, and we also then see the leadership of the Jews stirring up folks and getting him pushed out of town. A lot of opposition. And so if we experience failure in our own opportunities to share the love of Jesus, we ought not to be surprised. In fact, take comfort. Because this is the same way that Jesus walked, and if we're following him, then, well, he's got it, right? It's going to be what he wants. Now, the other piece of this puzzle, as we see him unpacking this, he meets the people, he goes strategically, and we see this throughout all of the missionary journeys. Paul, whether he's with Barnabas or with his Silas and Timothy, they go to a location and they first go to a synagogue, the Jewish place of worship and uh, time of education. And they would meet on the Sabbath to have that time in the Word and that time of encouragement. He would go to these places because this was the place where he would lay out the gospel amongst the people. He would lay it out because they were the ones familiar with the Word of God and the redemptive work of God. We read in Psalm 78, if you read through verses 1 through 8, this wonderful psalm that recounts the, the uh, command given all the way back in Deuteronomy to tell the stories of God's redemptive work throughout the generations to your children and your children's children and their children's children to say and to let them know how God had brought them out of the land of Egypt and into the promised land. In fact, when we pray, we pray for God's glory to be made known and for Christ to receive all of the glory. Yes, you're tracking with me. Do you know, if you read the scripture and you look at the word glory, it's always in context with God's redemptive work throughout the generations, whether in a small place in just a singular person's life, or big, like as he brings them out of Egypt, or back from the land of Babylon, or certainly in Christ Jesus' redemption of all people. God's glory is made known through his miraculous saving work of his creation. And he calls the Jewish people and he says, tell your children of these promises. Tell your children what I've done for the patriarchs. Tell your children of these words that I've given you in the Holy Scriptures so that they would know who I am. And it's this story that acts like a cradle to the infant born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those under the law. His name is Jesus. Because in the reception of Christ, we see that God's promises have been faithful and fulfilled throughout all the generations unto that moment. So how do we tell that story? We've got an opportunity 
Uh, I, the Odyssey had 37 kids today uh, for their kickoff this morning. And they came out and they were like, hey, this is really great. We finally have enough volunteers this morning that we can open up a preschool class in Odyssey so the preschool kids get education at their level instead of just going with the big kids and just going with the flow. All of that, right? Wonderful. Now, to be clear, when it, we say that we have enough volunteers to do that today, that doesn't mean tomorrow or next Sunday. And we hear the command that God has called us to tell this to our children and our children's children and so on. And it says we, that means all of us. We does not mean the people next to you. And when I say you, it doesn't mean everyone else in the room. God has called it, he's commanded it, and he said this is who we are to be. Ones who tell the redemptive work of God to the future generations. So, we come to a question. It says in Acts 13, 46, and this is one that I think we get often confused. Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly as the, as the Jews, the leadership of the Jews there in Antioch, responded back trying to get rid of him and, and reviling the, the proclamation of the gospel. He said, or they said, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you, and then you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. So behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. Paul, in his own testament, which is what we call the epistle to the Romans, says in the first chapter in verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for all who believe. Here are the three parts. Ashamed of the gospel, power of God for all who believe. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. And how we understand that relationship is crucial because otherwise it will make a misconception and a misappropriation of who we are as God's people and we will lose peace and unity within the church. So kids, come on down. Let's do this. Kids, come on down to the front. Yes, 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 yes. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Let's do this. There's an easy way to explain this relationship. It is you. Here, you guys come sit right up here in the front. Sit right up here in the front, and I'll sit by you. Yes, come on, come on, come on. Almost, almost, almost. Here we go. Good morning. Good morning. Do you know what yesterday was? It's August 12th. It was my birthday. Yes, thank you. You called. You called me. Thank you so much. You were supposed to go to my birthday? Well, you should always know my birthday. Everybody should know my birthday. Absolutely. Okay. And what is the one thing you got to have on your birthday? Cake. That's what I said as presents, but everybody else said cake. Yeah. It's cake, right? Here, I've got a cake right here I want to show you. I probably only get clothes now that I'm older. <laughs> You're cheeky today. That's fun. So, take a look at this guy. Come here. Come take a look at this. I'll let you smell it. No, it's not old. It's from yesterday. It's from my birthday. Ooh, it is cookies. It's cookies and cream buttercream with chocolate in the middle and a vanilla cake in the middle of there too. Yeah, right? Doesn't that smell delicious? Yes, I agree with you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Hmm, well, we'll talk about... Okay, so... What's the rules with cake? So you go to a birthday party, and the person who's having a birthday, come over here, come over here so you can see, has a birthday cake, right? Who gets to eat the birthday cake? Who gets to have the first piece of the cake? The birthday person, right? So if it was yesterday, it's me. And who gets to have the best piece of the birthday cake? It's, what is it, the, big, the best piece is the biggest? No. Which one is it? It's a corner piece with the most frosting. <laughs> Amateurs. Yeah, that's the best piece. So if you look, sometimes it's on a corner. This one was circle, so you had to pay attention to where all of these little flowers were on top. Now, and if you want a piece of this, uh, you can get one from Miss Kimberly. She makes these cakes, and they're delicious. But, uh, yes, so that'll be good. Um, yes. You don't like cake? Not this kind of cake? Oh, I'm sorry about that then you're invited to my birthday. <laughs> so, listen. So the person whose birthday it is, they get the first piece of the cake, right? But that means then after that, who else gets cake? 
everybody gets cake, right? And the reality is, is the first piece better than the second or last piece or anything like that? No, they're all the same cake. They're all delicious. In this way also, so is the gospel. The good news that Jesus has come as the Messiah, the Savior to save us from our sins, is like birthday cake. That promise was made for the Jewish people. Okay? Jesus was born a Jew. He was born to fulfill the promises that God would save his people from their sins. And so when Jesus showed up like the birthday cake, the Jews were to receive the promise in Jesus, the first piece of the cake. But like a birthday, the promise of Jesus is for everyone. It's for everyone who celebrates. And in this way, the gospel of Jesus is shared with the world. The gospel of Jesus reminds us that even though the celebration and the Savior was promised to just the Jews, a piece of Jesus, the cake, the good news, is for every single person that we can all celebrate. Yes? Do you ever go to a birthday party because you're excited to eat the cake? Yes. I went to one yesterday. You went to one yesterday? And were you excited to eat the cake? And play How would it f- games. And play games? At Boomtown. Wow, that's a good birthday. And you ate all your cake, which is why you've got a sugar uh, coma. <laughs> Have you ever had to leave a party without getting cake? Yes. yes. How does that feel? Horrible. That feels horrible. You're absolutely right. I have caused my children to cry many a time because we had to leave before the cake was cut. Now, we are going to ask God to help us because he gives us the love of Jesus like the sweetest birthday cake to share with our world. And it would be so sad if our friends, if our teachers, if our our family didn't also get to know the love of Jesus and taste how sweet a gift that is. So we're going to pray and we're going to ask him for help, okay? Can we do that? All right. Dear God, thank you for sending Jesus and welcoming us to share in him Help us to share the sweetness of his promise with our friends at school, our teachers, our family, everyone we meet, because it stinks if we miss out on cake. In Jesus' precious name, amen. All right, boys and girls, we're also going to do something else special today. Today is the day before we get ready to go back to school, yes? Who's eighth grade? Who's excited to go back to school? Are you really? Okay, so we're half. We're half and half. Well, I'm glad. You might as well be excited because you're going either way. So what we're going to do, what we're going to do is I'm going to have you guys spread out down a straight line down this center aisle. Would you just spread out all the way up and down this? Go ahead. You can move your legs quickly. Run if you need to. Yep, yep, yep. Let's spread out. Spread out, spread out, spread out. All up and down that line. Oh, see, you guys are doing way better than my last group. Thank you. Yep, spread out. We'll keep some of you up front. Okay, perfect. Stop right there. Perfect. Okay. (laughs) I love that. Look at you. Directions. Congregation, I'm going to invite you to stand and just lay a nice hand on one of these these kids' shoulders or just extend through somebody else. Go ahead and just lay a hand on them because we're going to send them out this week. Yep. Yep. Yes, you get a pass. Absolutely. Stay seated. We'll come to you. Kids, I want you to look up at all these faces. Look at all these people who have reached out to show you that they love you, to show you that they have your back, that they're excited for you, that even though you may be scared at a new building, a new teacher, a new circumstance, new friends, that you always have friends here who love you and are watching out for you, even in a big, big school. And we're going to pray over you now. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for these young ones. We thank you for the new beginning that they are about to start this in the next coming weeks. We ask that you'd watch over them, that you'd give them strength, that you would give them wisdom and insight, that you'd help them to keep complaining and those negative feelings down to a minimum, but that each day would bring fun and learning and that you'd continue to build them up and grow them into the people you would have them be as adults. Lord, let them know that they are always loved by these people around them and that these people see them, support them, and pray for them throughout this journey and will be with them until that day when you return in glory. We ask in Jesus' precious name, amen. Adults, you can go back to your pews, and then kids, you can go back to your seats. 
I'd love to tell you I was done with the sermon, but that was only three out of five points. So don't get too excited. Ooh. Um, hey, kiddos, let's do this. After church, you le let's leave together. Let's go down the fellowship hall, and we'll share this cake. How does that sound? One kid says good. Well, that kid gets a piece, but y'all can have one as well. Let's, we'll cut it up, and you can take it home with you. There's few enough of you that we I can share it. With the 37, I hate you, that wasn't going to play out. See, the trick is, hopefully, as you guys have started to figure out, that a children's message while for the kids is also for you. We get this confusing thing where we read this thing in the gospel, uh, or in Romans 1.16, and we see in other places, we hear that it says, the, uh, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for the salvation of all who believe, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile, and we interpret it sequentially. What we think is that, okay, so Jesus came first to the Jews, and because they did not receive him, then he set them aside and moved on to the Gentiles. We take it with that parable that Jesus told that Luke accounts about the wedding feast, where he, he was holding a wedding feast, and he invited all of his friends who didn't come. So then he said, go out to the roads and bring the lame, the beggars, and the weak, and let them have their seats. And that idea almost even plays out into that idea also from Romans, where we hear that we too are now sons and daughters of Abraham because we have been grafted into the people of God. And when we think sequentially, it becomes a very terrible thing, like a cancer that roots up in and through the church, okay? Like rotten uh, roots. You see throughout the history, when the church thinks like this, what happens to the church? You can see it even in Luther's day and before that. Anti-Semitism quickly becomes a key part of who we are as, as a people. You know that Luther was, was anti-Semitic, right? Which was not like a big surprise. Everybody was anti-Semitic. So this is not a cancel culture thing today because that was the understanding and the way they thought back then. So we're not going to do that. But this anti-Semitic culture has this sequential understanding of Romans. And this idea that, well, he came to the Jews, but they missed out. So they're out and we are in. Do you know how deadly it is for a group of Christians to think they're out and we are in, no matter who those people are? Do you see how easy it becomes that we become inward focused and self-satisfied when we start by considering the Jews as a missed opportunity, but we're the ones who did it right? And that's not at all what he's saying here. Paul, a Jew who worships a Jew from Jerusalem. It's not a matter of sequence. It's a matter of priority. Protos can be first. It can mean sequentially, and it can also mean of uh, priority. The Jews, like the birthday cake, it's their birthday. It's their promise. The Messiah that was meant for the creation was given to and promised to Abraham and to his lineage. So when it came time to celebrate the advent and the coming of God's salvation for all the world, it was their party to celebrate. When it says, first for the Jews, then for the Gentiles, you could change that, those, the, the translation of that to say, priority to the Jews and then also the Gentiles, like birthday cake. It's their celebration to rejoice because God has been faithful to his promises and it's time to celebrate. But the goodness of this is that all people are welcomed in to share in the sweetness of God's redemption for his people. We have been grafted in and ought to celebrate their day. It gets tough because a lot of us go to a birthday party for the cake. What kind of cake are you having? <laughs> when is it going to be cut? <laughs> It makes us think so much differently about our world because if we begin to think that way and we track with this accurately, we start to realize, my goodness, there's a Jewish synagogue down the street this way and a Jewish uh, uh, school down this way, and there's, there's Jewish people all over the place. And I've never ever once in the last, I don't know, eight some odd years that I've been here, thought to myself, my goodness, I'm so excited. Hey, your Savior is here, the one promised to you before the creation of the world, and he's my Savior too. We have so much to celebrate together. Thank God that he is redeemed you and also brought me into those promises. Woo, this is a good day. Nice to see you. Because that changes the way we think. We've been brought from out to in, and he's welcoming all people to share in that same celebration. We don't have to worry if there's going to be enough cake to go around because everybody gets a slice. And it's just our joy to celebrate them. 
and what God has done in and through their people. And that we too are welcome to celebrate with them. It creates mission for the church because we see that all people are invited to join in the celebration of the Lamb and to celebrate His redemption for us. And it also creates peace. Because when we have a mind that they are missing and we are the insiders and we start to look at everybody else as other than rather than welcome to. And we begin to realize that what actually binds us together is not that we have it right and other people had it wrong. But in fact, we all have been brought in and have peace because we all have a peace. That's good writing. I don't want to burn it. That was pretty good. Too bad I didn't write it down. It just showed up. And lastly, we see that many people reject the gospel. We see that throughout the entire missionary journeys of Paul, people reject. The Gentiles who are on the outside reject because it's an unnecessary teaching that they're just not grabbing hold of. And the particularly spiritual, the Jews all over the Mediterranean world hear it and they can't connect it because they're more interested and they're holding tight to their practices. They're holding tight to the practices of circumcision, obeying the Sabbath, the holidays, and the, and the sacrifice and offering of their, of their gifts, right? See, sometimes within the spiritual group of people, we get so caught up in the practice, and we have this idea that practice will produce promises. We saw it from the Pharisees and the Jews who cried out, crucify, crucify. How could you tell me not to measure my, my pickle and my cumin and my thyme and tell me that all these things that I have done in order to bring and enact God's fulfillment of his promise are not worth anything. Because the gospel is a free gift of Christ Jesus. See, we too could take just a moment to reflect of ourselves, asking how have we loved the practice more than the promise? How have we taken what promise has produced in practice, but held on to just the action and lost out that that was a free gift all along? See, Jesus started with a promise. Paul started with this promise of free grace and a gift of Christ Jesus, and it changed the way he did life and his practices for him, the Jews, and the relationship to the Gentiles. And so we also are called to start with the promise and see how that fuels how we live amongst each other. As we continue with this time, I'm going to ask that you would pray with me. And we're going to pray over Isaiah 29, verse 14. Lord, teach us your will, teach us your ways, teach us to trust in your promise and your free grace and gift that there's nothing we can do to control it or to keep it. We cannot find any satisfaction in our abilities but what you are doing. For you have said, Behold, I will again do wonderful things with this people, with wonder upon wonder, and with the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the discernment of their discerning men shall be hidden. Lord, remind us that it is not about anything we have done or anything that we have aspired to that has made us yours. But like Arden this morning, you have washed us in the blood of the Lamb and made us right by your free grace and gift through Christ Jesus, that we all might share in the grace and glory of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Until that day he returns in glory, we pray in his name. Amen. We're going to go ahead and take some time to pray for the church and the world and all people according to their needs. I invite you to please rise as we join together. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and the opportunity to hear the good news of Christ Jesus. But we ask that you'd be also with those who are specifically in times of hurt or in, or in times of celebration, in times of mourning, in times of excitement for the possibility of seeing friends and family and having some respite. Lord, we pray for Jeff and family who are traveling home. Uh, for Galen uh, as well, who had an auto accident, and we pray for healing for him. We pray for Larry, and we pray for the Grainies and the Olivers who are traveling. We ask that you'd watch over them and that you'd give them uh, safe travels over this, this next season and this next month and return them home safely. Lord, for those who are suffering uh, from illness, heartache, and hurt, uh, we pray for Carl, Rich, and Sandra. We pray for Efren, who is in a serious motorcycle accident. We pray over the doctors who are working uh, on him so diligently and the nurses. We pray for Tom for his healing. We pray for Robert, uh, who's having heart surgery uh, in, the, in another week. And we pray.
pray that you would just help them, uh, as you'd help him and just give him rest and peace and trust in your goodness. We pray for Andy, uh, who's in a coma. We ask that you would um, just watch over him and that you'd give all those who are gathered around him peace and trust in your providence and your goodness. We pray for Jean, who's in her 90s, who's living in Florida. Uh, she took a fall, and we pray for her healing, and as the family figures out how to best support her, um, going forward, we pray that you'd give them wisdom and insight in your will. Uh, for Lene, we pray over her cancer uh, testing this week. We pray for a, a negative result, which would be a positive reality. And Lord, we just ask that you'd watch over her. We ask for Mary, that you would help her to process and deal with a lot of trauma going on. And we pray that you'd give her wisdom and people to build her up. Safira's emotional health and Greg as well. We pray that you'd watch over them and strengthen them. And Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to celebrate birthdays. We pray for Dave uh, and Wayland. We thank you for their birthdays this week. And we pray that it'd be time of fun and fellowship for cake to be shared with everybody. And maybe a little left over to have in the days after. And Lord, also we pray for all of those who are um, reeling in the wake of all of these fires as they are continuing to sweep over Maui. Lord, we pray uh, for those who've lost their lives and loved ones and home and property. We pray for the church there. We pray for Emmanuel um, as they now go into a different ministry season to bless and support those around them as they are also waiting for support. Lord, uh, as you will, use us to be able to bless and support them as well as brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, we also pray for the Williams family and for Ruth's family at her passing. We ask that you would just watch over and widen them up in the hope of the resurrection. In all of these things, we trust in your will and we trust in your providence as we pray the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated, and I've got just a couple of announcements for you. Um, first of all, would somebody be willing to take the cake down and cut that and get that to the kids and help me out? Because I realize I've got to shake your hands and stuff too during the last song. Anybody? Thank you. Appreciate your help. Thank you. Okay, um, we'll make that happen. So kids, uh, during this last song, you're going to walk out with me, and we're going to walk down and grab a piece of cake to take home. Thank you for coming today. Um, we also um, have just a couple of announcements. The fall kickoff is next Sunday. Uh, we'll be having the Avengers and all the other ministry leaders as well around their booths and giving you information about what's going on in the ministries and how you can plug in and get involved. Uh, the email went out this last Friday, so a few days ago. So go ahead and look at that. Do some research to figure out which uh, tables you want to get to and which places you want to sign up and get involved. When you do, you'll get a St. Luke's shirt to kick off the ministry fair. They're pretty cool. They look like a, like a softball-style T-shirt. They're fun, blue, green, and orange. You'll get one, so come out and sign up. St. Luke's Roots is on uh, September 16th from 8 to 4. The first half of the class, uh, oh, and this is for new folks, uh, if you'd like to become a member or you'd like a refresher in the Lutheran doctrine. Um, the first half of the class, we go over the, the doctrine and the teachings of the church, and then in the second half, you'll meet the ministry leaders during lunch, and then they'll take you around and show you how that gets lived out here at St. Luke's. And so we'll have elders there, we'll have ministry leaders there for you to connect with, and it'll be a, a joyous time to connect and begin a, a new membership at St. Luke's. If you'd like to go to Israel, I think I've got two more spots that uh, opened up, and you'd like to go, uh, see me, and I can help get you that email. Just text me or, or call or email this week, and that will be just great. And then, before we head out for service, and with a blessing, I'm going to invite you all to please rise. But first, but first, but first, I know I did the motion. Um, if I have any teachers, administrators, faculty, staff, anybody who's helping and supporting the education system and the people this year, would you please stand up first? Wonderful. It is, okay, great. I was like, this is going to be hard to lay hands on these folks. So we'll do it spiritually from a distance.
Um, it, is, it is the history of the church and the practice to lay hands as a sign of physical and spiritual connection that you're going to be sent out as missionaries into this place to serve and to love these kids. But because you're so spread out and it'll be very difficult to lay hands on you, we will do it spiritually. So would you all please rise? And if you're close to them, you can put a nice hand on them. I have to clarify since we have older siblings and younger siblings in the church these days. Nice hands. And you'd like to lay a hand on them, we'll pray over them. Lord, Heavenly Father, we ask that you'd bless these. We ask that as they go out into this school year, that you'd give them an endurance, a long-suffering and supportive and patient love for these students, for their co-workers, for their administration, and for all the challenges that come in the face of trying to raise up these young ones. Lord, we pray that you'd give them insight and you'd give them rest tonight as some are preparing tomorrow and then in the days and months to come as well, each day providing for its own. Lord, we know that each day is a day you've made, so we rejoice at the opportunities that they'll have with the kiddos, and we also know that each day comes with enough trouble that we don't have to worry about tomorrow, and we ask that you'd bless them in that, and that you would give them trust that you'll take care of each and every day that comes, but that you've given them a blessed opportunity to share the love of Jesus with those around them. We thank you for them. We thank you for their mission and their jobs, their vocation in our community and the work that they do to raise up our young ones. We bless them, and we thank you for them in Jesus' precious name. Amen. And now we'll finish our worship service with the salutation and with the benediction. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen, amen, amen. All right, kids, let's go get some cake. The rest of you sing the last song. Go in peace, serve the Lord, thanks be to God.